Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast, and this is my review of The Fable 2, The Killer Who Doesn't Kill, a Japanese action-comedy-drama hybrid from 2021. This is, of course, a sequel to The Fable, which came out in 2019, and I recently reviewed the original film on this channel, so let's take a look at this second installment. Akira, played by Junichi Okada, is the legendary killer known as the Fable. Following the order of his boss and due to being overworked, he continues to live peacefully with his partner Yoko, played by Fumino Kimura, while pretending to be ordinary siblings. Akira still works part-time at a design company, which they established in the first film, but befriends a young handicapped girl, played by Yorina Hirate, who lives in the same neighborhood as him. Meanwhile, a man named Utsubo, played by Shinichi Tsutsumi, who lives in the same neighborhood, is a representative for an NPO, but he secretly works with a contract killer, played by Masunobu Ando, to set people up for extortion, and they begin to target someone at Okada's design company. So, we basically get some additional color on the villain of the movie pretty early on. Now, uh, Tsutsumi's character acts like a, like a politician in public. You know, gives himself a very respectable reputation. But he's a true slimeball in private. And we see him execute a man at the very beginning of the film using a backhoe and a rope, which, not something I think I've ever seen in a movie before. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, pretty impressive in his ruthlessness. He does this in conjunction with his blackmail schemes, which have gained him quite a bit of money on the black market. And Ando's character is basically Tsutsumi's right-hand man, and we soon realize that our villain has a beef with our main protagonist from a prior conflict that went back years ago. And this handicapped girl, uh, who Okada saves at the opening action scene, is also part of the bad guy's organization. So there's, it seems more complicated than it actually is. It really isn't that complex. But we have a nice little uh, variety of characters here and some good interaction. Now the placement of the action scenes is very similar to the first film. We get an action scene at the beginning and then an action scene near the end. Runtime is a little bit longer. It's uh, over two full hours. I think it's like 10 plus minutes longer than the first film. But I actually enjoyed the conflict building even more in this sequel when compared to its predecessor. You know, the dynamics involving the handicapped girl, the criminal, and our protagonist keep things interesting. And the interaction between these characters is more absorbing and actually even incorporates a few kind of creepy moments. <laughs> like, the bad guy is pretty bad. Uh, more interesting than, like, this, like, the Yakuza stuff that we got in the first film. This is very different, and I like that. At first, the way in which Okada reconnects with the handicapped girl seems like a huge coincidence when it happens in the film, but then you understand that the bad guy is actively looking for our protagonist anyway, so, so he's looking for him and he's in the same neighborhood kind of trying to figure out his identity and stuff, so he's kind of tracing him. <clears throat> so it makes sense that they would meet by chance, because it's kind of a smaller neighborhood that they're in or a subsection of a city. So uh, the writing here, I think, is actually pretty good. Now, Okada's female handler, who's another character, uh, also gets more development in this film compared to the last one. Uh, one scene, her excellent memory skills are put to the test and utilized. Another scene, she has a confrontation with one of the bad guys. And, uh, yeah, she's very good in this. I liked her quite a bit. And then the female lead from the first film is also in this, but... Uh, receives less less time. So basically, the handicapped girl kind of replaces her as the as one of the leads. Performances here are very good, from top to bottom. I think the casting in the sequel is pretty great. I would probably rank Okada and Tsutsumi in my top ten favorite uh, Japanese actors from modern times. They're both high up there. So you know, both of them have a ton of screen presence. Always nice to see. Uh, Ando as well in a role, and most people remember Ando from Battle Royal. He played the crazy dude. Uh, but he's been in some other good stuff in recent years, like Green Minds, Metal Bats, Smuggler, and the most recent Roroni Kenshin movie. 
But the ladies are good here too. You know, Fumino Kimura is a very playful badass, I guess you could call her. And then uh, Yurina Hirate is like this quiet intensity to her. So everyone here is really good in their roles. And even though you have like kind of a bigger cast and it feels like a uh, complicated plot, just the quality of the acting is just so good from top to bottom. It really, uh, it really kind of elevates the film a notch above it would have been otherwise. Now, for the action, I think the film opens with a scene that's even better than the first film. It's like a short montage of assassinations. And then there's a really cool like runaway SUV sequence in a parking garage. And it showcases some pretty legit stunt work. A uh, very nice start to the flick. And then, of course, you have that middle section, just like the first film, that's focused on the other genres. You know, the drama, uh, the humor, the conflict building, and it works well. And then you get the action scene at the end, which is a very cool, like, apartment shootout fight scene that takes place mostly on the side of the apartment, which is under construction. So you got, like, a huge scaffolding structure, and bad guys are, like, fighting up and down the scaffolding, and it's like a shootout scene. So you get, like, snipers, hitmen, uh, some acrobatics, uh, a cool fight in kind of a, a cramped alleyway, or cramped... It's like a crevasse in the apartment complex between two guys who are fighting while they're falling in between, like, the, uh, the buildings. It's a pretty, pretty cool scene. And then some of the gunfights have, like, the... Uh, if you've ever seen the Christian Bale movie, Equilibrium... You know, it has kind of like that gun, uh, gun fu type stuff where they have guns and they're fighting in close proximity and trying to like get in an angle to like shoot each other while they're fighting. She gets some of that, which is pretty cool. Uh, some of the fighting, a little bit unrealistic in terms of some of the, uh, I guess, acrobatics and stuff like that. But it's quite, uh, oh, and also some of the bad guys have really bad aim with their guns as well. So it's a few little few little gripes during the during the fight but it's it's very very entertaining and uh fun to watch now if i were to rank it compared to the finale of the first film i think the finale to the first film is a little bit better than the finale to this one but it's still quite good and then you have like this final confrontation after that involving a landmine which is uh it's a pretty cool scene too kind of, to kind of finish the film off so yeah, I think The Fable 2, The Killer Who Doesn't Kill, very solid sequel. It's like, it approximates the quality of the first film, really, in my opinion. Um, if you watch the first film and you enjoy it, check out the sequel, because you'll probably enjoy this as well. And it's it feels a little bit different, but it still feels like it's in the same franchise, so it's, it's good stuff. Currently available on Netflix, and as always, we will see you next time.